Okay, this is another in our series of uh, modules on uh, pediatric fractures, and we're getting all the way down to the foot. So today, we'll, our focus will be strictly on fractures and dislocations of the immature foot. So, they are rare. Why? How many have you seen recently? I, I have not seen any recently. Yes. And so why are they rare? The pediatric foot is very flexible. Very good, yes. The pediatric foot is flexible, so forces applied there really uh, are transferred to the ankle, to the tibia and fibula, and knee. So we see these other fractures, but we don't see much in the foot because there's enough flexibility that they can absorb the uh, forces that are applied. So, they're using minor fractures. And here is, here's a good example. This is a patient that fell and, and had a minor injury and had some swelling. And here you can see these fractures at the bases of the metatarsals, and they're undisplaced. And these usually just require nothing more than just simple immobilization. And they usually heal pretty rapidly. Now, there are some that uh, fractures that have major consequences. What would you say, what were those fractures in the foot? There are some that uh, really can give them lots of problems if they're not treated appropriately. Fractures of the... Base the fifth metatarsal. Base of the fifth metatarsal. That's more of an adult, but I, we'll talk about that. Yeah, that's one. What else? What are the biggest bones in the foot? The uh, calcaneus and the talus. That's right. And so the talus is one, and <clears throat> this one can create a lot of problems. Here you can see this is a fracture right through the neck of the talus, and the talus fractures. So, what's the mechanism of injury? Well, if you have a dorsiflexion force, you can impinge the tailor neck onto the anterior lip of the tibia. That's very good, yes. What happens is that they'll fall and they'll have maximum dorsiflexion, forced dorsiflexion, and they'll also be in some pronation. And so this, you're right, exactly right, this is what happens. This anterior lip of the tibia mm -hmm. then is forced against the neck of the talus, and so that's what you get, and you get a fracture, and it's, so it's a secondary fracture, or a secondary force from the uh, distal tibia. So, if, if you're going to get x-rays, what's the best view? The canal view would probably Yes, be. right. This was popularized by uh, Terry Canale and Kelly out of the um, Campbell Clinic. What is what is the canal view? Uh, so you're going to be about 15 degrees pronated and about 75 degrees. Right. The, uh, Very good. It's usually it's an angulation, and it actually gets the, that way you can see the whole uh, long axis of the calcaneus, and you do kind of pronate it so it brings the calcaneus right into the long axis, so you can get an X-ray. And here's a good example. This is a lateral view, and here you can see the fracture. It doesn't show up very good, but it doesn't tell you how much displacement there is. But there is a fracture line here, and it's very difficult to tell you exactly how much displacement you have. But if you get the canal view, which has it goes down the long axis of the uh, talus, here you can see the amount of displacement. You can see the true displacement that occurs here and gives you an idea how much you're going to have to uh, treat and what, what kind of treatment you're going to do. Here you can see. So, it, sometimes there's really not much displacement. How much displacement can you um, accept? I think five millimeters, sir. Yeah, it's less than five millimeters of displacement and there's only about five degrees of angulation. So, usually you can accept that if it's uh, somewhat undisplaced or minimally displaced, but most of them are really displaced more than that. So, now, if you've got a uh, displaced one, how do you uh, achieve a reduction? What maneuvers do you have to do? Well, if, you, if the injury is due to dorsiflexion and some pronation, you'd want to plantar flex and supine. Yes, right. So you have to reverse the deformity. That's, that's usually true for most fractures. You, you, you need to understand, that's why it's very understand, you need to understand the mechanism of the injury. So in most fractures, what you do is reverse the deformity. 
And so what you do, you correct the plantar flexion, and that usually cl helps close it, and then you actually uh, supinate it a little bit. You can hear, you can supinate it a little bit. And if you can do an open reduction, now this is one way you can go, you go here in the safe area, which is between the flexor house as longest and the anterior tib. Okay, here's a, an example of one. This was a female and she was a cheerleader and she, they could get on triangles, you know, and she was the top girl and then she fell. And of course here she has a fracture of her talus. You can see the fracture of her talus. And we did, uh, through that approach, we did an open reduction and then put some screws in there. And this is her post-operative. And here she is post-operative and that screw was anterior and it wasn't, didn't seem to bother her. Um, it was anterior to the lateral malleolus, so it didn't seem to bother her flexion and extension. So here she is three months post-op. What's your assessment of how well she's doing? What's going on here? She, What's that? She looks like she's she's got a Hawkins sign at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, what does that indicate? What, 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 Re, that means the blood supply is intact. So that's there. right. To reabsorb bone, you've got to have blood supply. And so, if it becomes osteopenic, and you call this the so-called Hawkins sign, so which tells you that you do have circulation to the dome of the talus. So it does indicate that there's. She's, get, she's healing well, and she's not going to have at least a, a vascular necrosis on the dome. She could have it in some other parts of her uh, talus. So this is a 14-year-old female that fell from a balcony. Here you can see this fracture. And unfortunately, she was seen in the emergency room, and they sent her home. They said she's got a, just a foot sprain, <laughs> and they sent her home. And so she didn't get any better, and so she came to our clinic about two weeks later. So you, there, if you're going to treat them, you need to understand a kind of a classification, how they're classified. What classification have you used in the adults? We use the uh, Hawkins classification. That's yeah, right. That's right. Pictures. Hawkins. And Hawkins was originally in, in Colorado there. So... There is a classification, that's Hawkins. He's, it's been around for about 27, about 37 years now. And so it does give you some prediction of which ones are gonna get avascular necrosis. And it seems to be widely used. Is this what you use in the adults when you see them? Yes, sir. Yeah. So here are the four ones, one, two, three, and four. And this is the Hawkins classification. So we'll go through each one. The Hawkins one is what? Non-displaced. Yeah, non-displaced or displaced within the limits that you can accept or you can get by with just a little minimal reduction. So it's essentially undisplaced or displaced in enough uh, less than what's acceptable. And here the avascular necrosis rate is anywhere from zero to 13%. And really, you don't see this very often because most of the fractures are displaced. So, Hawkins two, what's that one? The subtalar. Yeah, there's usually some subtalar subluxation and dislocation, as you can see here. You can see this, and it's it's all dislocated and, and it's markedly separated, and the fracture enters the subtalar joint, and their subtalar is somewhat intact, but it's uh, it does involve the subtalar joint and there's more displacement so if there's more displacement what would you expect higher rate of AD. yeah that's right it's up to 20 to 50 percent so it's the most common type that we see three what's next the three it's dis yeah displacements with um, yeah and here two joints uh, and yeah there's some ankle joint is dislocated as well so this one is markedly displaced, and the Taylor body is kind of extruded, usually around the deltoid ligament. And these are often open fractures, and reduction is very difficult. And here you can do a closed reduction, plantar foot, and flex the knee, and then you can do open with some joysticks. But the avascular necrosis rate is going to be real high on this one. So Hawkins four, 
involves both those two and then the Taylor navicular joint. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's added to, this was one that was added by Canale in 1974 and it incorporates, as you said, the Taylor navicular subluxation and it's a rare variant and the complete Taylor neck fractures that don't fit the uh, type four. In other words, it's, this talus is really extruded and markedly displaced and then this joint here is displaced as well. Okay, so let's go back. You, you, if you, there's some other things that kind of you have to take into consideration, whether there's comminution, and that's an important predictor of results because um, prognosis in subtalar arthritis, and it's included in the AOOTA classification as kind of a modifier. So here's our patient, the one that shows up two weeks later in the in the clinic. Is it fracture or bo broken, doctor? Excuse me. Is it fracture or broken? I would say both. <laughs> yeah. It's, okay. It's, and so this is a Hawkins two type, as we see here. And so this is kind of the clinical picture. Here you see a lot of swelling and bulli formation, and notice it's a little bit supinated. So, what's your first step? What are you going to do? Well, yeah. you reduce it, and you try to reduce, maybe try to get some reduction uh, closed, and then you stabilize it with some pins, and then you secure it. And that won't hold it, and so you secure it with screws. And this one had the lateral process of the talus was a separate fragment, so this required an open reduction from a lateral approach. And here you can see the uh, two screws in there. And since we're going to put, you need to go way around posterior here as well. And I'll show you why. So what about the body and neck? What's the standard uh, way of putting the screws in? Anterior to posterior, retrograde, or antegrade? What are they doing? So you can, you can go anterior to posterior, or you can go posterior to anterior. Yeah, the problem going anterior is you have to put it through the joint and it's hard to get to if it's the tail and the vector joints and the thigh is, is intact. And so this one, this patient here had posterior to anterior. And you can see those, that seemed to be the more common way that's been described now, which means that you have to go around there posteriorly and get behind the uh, perineal uh, tendons and uh, which means that it's better because you're not on the medial side where you have the nerve vascular bundle. And here you can see the pictures here. That's posterior to anterior. And then of course, here you got the two screws in the lateral process. I don't have the x-rays, but I did see this patient about three months postoperatively, and unfortunately, he went ahead to develop avascular necrosis. But that occurred at the time of the injury. That didn't occur because of our surgery. I don't think we can say that the surgery caused it. So you've done this, you've re uh, released it, or you've reduced it and stabilized it. What are you going to do next? Well, you have to cast and mobilize and keep the patient non-weight-bearing. Yeah, you make them non-weight-bearing, uh, but they're allowed to go weight-bearing once the fractures heal, because it doesn't, that doesn't seem to have any effect on the development of avascular necrosis. So. What, what is it that's uh, unique? Why do we get avascular necrosis here? There's a uh, retrograde blood supply. That's right. You can actually even have a, a non-displaced fracture and it will injure these blood vessels. They come through the sinus tarsi and the other ones, the major ones, come through the dorsum of the neck. So anytime you're doing surgery in the foot, you always want to avoid the sinus tarsi and the dorsum of the neck, especially the dorsum of the neck. So even if they don't have displacement, you can, about 30% of them will get avascular necrosis. Because here's one that was immediate post-operative. She had a significant injury. She had an injury of the distal tibial epiphysis as well. And here she is post-op. And then here's the destruction later on. You can see that it's collapsed and so forth. And this patient's going to need, how are you going to treat this one? She's going to need a fusion later. 
Yeah. When she's healed. When she's what healed. kind of fusion do you need? What are they popularized? <clears throat> so she'll need a subtalar. Um, yeah. You actually can do a fusion as long as you don't get to the physis. Mm -hmm. You can do, in, uh, in mm, okay. uh, days of the past when we had a lot of polio, we would do pantator fusions. And so you can just do the, just go very, just take off the articular surface and the articular surface here. But of course, as you say, you probably want to wait because this is probably dead bone. It's not going to do it. The older one they do in the adult is a so-called Blair fusion, which you take and put a big piece of bone here. And, and you know, actually she did pretty well. Her function was almost normal. But she's going to have trouble when she gets older. Now, there's uh, sometimes there's just little osteochondral fractures. They occur on the lateral and on the medial side. Okay. They're usually non, which ones are usually non-traumatic? I believe the lateral side. That's right. It's usually on the, well, actually, it's, it's, it can be in the medial side as well. And what is this? Is this a fracture? What is it? It's actually just a little localized area of avascular necrosis. It could be due to some kind of compressive effect. Maybe there was a severe sprain that occurred. You can <coughs> see that. So that's usually non-traumatic, and there is also the traumatic ones. And when we talked the other day about ankle fractures, what is in the stage two uh, supination inversion, what does the medial talus do? It actually pushes off the medial malleolus, and here's what happened in this patient here. You can see this patient had a fractured fibula, which reduced, but then when it was <coughs> Instead of pushing off the, the medial malleolus here, this one got just a little fracture right here. So, what's the what's the basis of treatment for these uh, fractures? So it depends on the size. And what else? Um, and if it's displaced in the displacement. Yeah, or what else? What does the patient come in? Will it oh, sim symptomatic. If they yeah, that's pain. right. And what 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 do, what do they usually tell you? <coughs> Every time they move their ankle, what do they tell you? Catches. It. Yeah, they get a click sound, mm -hmm. and then usually they have some pain and a little bit of fusion with it. So usually they require uh, treatment only if they're symptomatic. Yeah. Although some people will argue that if they're a pretty good size, you maybe need to do something. So. If you're going to excise it, how do you get to it? Well, if it's on the lateral side, you can go directly into it, but on the medial side, it's more posterior, so you have to do an osteotomy of the medial malleolus. Yeah, uh, but usually, the, the, you, of course, most of the time these occur in the older kids, so <coughs> that's a good way. But a lot of times now, if it's the lateral side, you can go directly because it's right there. It's a little bit more anterior, and some people, are pretty good with the arthroscope, and then go in there and take it out arthroscopically. And like you say, on the medial side, if it's an older child, you can see you can do an osteotomy of the, actually of this, and then you can go in there and just <coughs> edit that out, and actually put a little bone graft in there. And that seems to work pretty good. You try to maintain the articular surface here. You have the osteotomy, the medial malleolus, and then you cure it out the dead bone. And then you put a little bit of bone graft in there, and then you can see you use a compression screw to hold it. And what you do is you put your, you make your hole for your, as you can see, you make your hole through your medial malleolus before you do the osteotomy. And then it's very easy to put that back. Okay, you place the malleolus. Now, here's the other major bone that you described that you have fr fractured. And <coughs> They're, they're usually a rare instance. Why don't you see many calcaneal fractures? Again, it's a it's a more flexible bone in the pediatric That's right. foot. And it also has a it's it also has a lot more flexible cartilage in it. So that seems to be able to absorb the forces as well. So how do they usually occur? A direct uh, a direct fall onto the. That's right. Calcaneal. It's usually associated with a fall. And that gives a compressive force applied to the hind foot when they fall. And so then that will produce a compressive effect. And actually you get a, a decrease in the height. And you also, a lot of times, will get a, usually the, the force is applied right directly to the subtalar joint. 
and especially the anterior facet and some of the posterior facet, and so you get collapse because the, the uh, uh, most of the calcaneus is mostly um, uh, uh, cancellous bone rather than cortical bone. So they fall from a height here, and then they get this calcaneus fracture. And so what else do you need to evaluate? You, if they fall from a height, then you also want to evaluate the lumbar spine. That's right. Fracture. Why? Well, the direct blow will transmit the force up the lumbar spine. And you can have compression fractures. What happens? What happens when they fall? They fall and they go forward, and so you can always check the spine um, because there's usually an associated lumbar flexion, and so you get a compression fracture time there. So you always need to check the spine. Uh, both clinically and with x-rays because there's a pretty high association of, of uh, lumbar spine fractures associated with this. So <laughs> here's a common etiology and this little boy says, the father says, oh it would be so nice if he could get on there and ride that and the, the kid says, look how I can get off with the, while the motor is still running. Well, should not have done that. This is a, a big type of fracture that, that you see. This is a direct fracture. And this gives you a type one in which there's a loss of bone associated usually in the body of the calcaneus. And so this is the initial fracture. So what are you gonna do? Can you put it back together? You can try. Yeah, well, actually <clears throat> three months later, we actually, he uh, had, the bone was essentially dead, and so it had it, and it was also hard to close, so we took out the calcaneus, and here he is here. What do you think he's gonna look like? I mean, he's got an absence of his calcaneus and his heel bone, he's gonna have a... Uh, well, he's, he's gonna have difficulty with plantar flexion, yeah. because although it, he still had some bit of Achilles tendon attached to this little fragment. And so you think he'd have trouble. So here he is seven years later, and he came in not because he had trouble with his ankle. He was complaining of the skin problem here associated with it. And here you can see he had pretty good plantar flexion. So that's the beauty of treating children. They seem to have a lot more repair than anything else. Now. The other thing that will happen is that you, they will be, you know, in the winter time, um, and they'll be sitting in the school and not doing much, watching television or, or watching, playing with their uh, iPads. And then they go out and they immediately start playing soccer. And they start right off the bat with a pretty heavy schedule. And that's what happened to this patient. This patient was a lot of pain when running. What do you see here? Anything? What are you suspicious of? He said the more he ran, the more it hurt. When he didn't run, it didn't hurt. Stress fracture. Right. That's a, that's a classic stress fracture. Now, sometimes in some of the age groups, they'll have kind of an apophysitis, and what do you call that? And so you want to make sure that they have t don't have tenderness here, but this boy had tenderness over the body of it, and that's called the old Seavers disease, in which you have, actually that occurs when you have a little bit less mature calcaneus, and that's usually just a kind of a little stretching of the tendon, and it usually resolves with time. So here he is, and there didn't seem to be any evidence of fracture. If you wanted to, though, if you wanted to be real aggressive, what would you use to look for, to especially there's a fracture? You probably need an MRI to evaluate for stress fracture. Well, that's pretty expensive. There's something cheaper. Um, bone scan? Yeah, bone scan is very easy. And that's what he had. He had a bone scan and he was positive. And then actually he comes back in two weeks and now you can see he's got some endosteocallus indicating he had a fracture. You can see it was a stress fracture. Now we go to the type two, which is extra articular of course, and this is what you see here, a little bit more of the body. And it can usually involve mostly the body. And here's another boy that had a, a lawnmower injury and he had a, 
um, fracture here, which was transverse and right through the non-articular, and you can see where his fracture was. And this was all due to this lawnmower injury itself. And here you can see there's not much displacement of the ankle joint, but you can see where that thing is displaced a little bit laterally, and it's transverse all across here. And here it is like this. How are you going to treat this one? Reduction and then uh, perhaps screw. a screw or a pin. Up yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, this is, a, this is one that's pretty easy to do because you, you, you actually got the open wound and you clean it out, debride it, and then you can actually reduce it and then you stabilize it. This one's stabilized with pins. I think nowadays I would probably use uh, cannulated screws, but this was done years ago before we had much cannulated screws. Types two and three, here you can see, they're still somewhat non-articular, but they begin to develop in the subtalar joint. You can see a little bit here. Or they may be anterior here. You can have this anterior process, fracture of the anterior process, and that's, what pulls that off? What's, uh, what's attached to the anterior process? Sensor digitorum brevis, and also there's some ligaments there. And the, what do they call this in the adult? You know? The, the French heel fracture. In other words, the women would be plantar flexed and they would have their heels, and the heels would break, and then they'd pull that off. So that was using an avulsion injury. There you can see where it is. And if it's not displaced very much, you don't do anything. If it is displaced, you just go in and, and and fix it and attach it, uh, so it's an anterior assertion. And uh, sometimes you can get avulsion of the apophysis as well. That's pretty rare, as you can see here. So the ones that we're really concerned about are the articular depressions, and they're usually a compressive force in which is pushed down, like here. And here's a 12-year-old. He had a joint compression type. You can see here. And you can see the marked displacement here where the articular surface has been pushed down. The uh, articular surface is still pretty much intact, but the fracture fragment has been pushed in there. So that gives you two cortical, actually four cortices, and so you have a lot more density. You can see here. So you can see here, the, it's really best to tell where the fracture is. With You really need CT scans on these and you can need a CT to see the true fragment structure. Okay, so here's a young child. Sometimes if they're not badly displaced, they will get some remodeling. So here's a patient had this, had 22 degrees uh, here. What do you call that angle? Uh, is it Bowler's angle? Yeah, Bowler's angle. And that, what should the normal value be? Well, it's probably 20 to 40 degrees is what it usually is. And it's a little bit unreliable below the age of 10 because there's a lot of cartilage in there, so you can't really see the true depression. And so this patient was just treated by observation, and you can see he actually got some remodeling, got him up to about 26 degrees. Although he probably may have some evidence as he gets older, since it involved the subtalar joint, you may develop some subtalar arthritis, you can see, but that's something you can accept. Now, this is a technique that you can use if you've got big fragments, and you can, here's a patient here, you can see Bowler's angle is that cut, and you can see where the fracture goes right through the posterior facet, and here you can see the displacement. But if you get a CT scan, you can see that it's <coughs> the articular surface is pretty much intact, but there are two big major fragments. So what technique can you use here? Do you have to open it up? Is there a technique? What do you do? How do you place a Steinman pin? That's right. It's called the Essex <coughs> Lepresti type thing where you put a Steinman pin in there. And here what you do is you advance the Steinman pin until you get it at the fracture site and you put the lift up the distal to reduce that. And then once you get it reduced, you just um, you advance the, the, into the proximal fragment. And here you can see, you compare it with the pre-op, and you can see that the articular surface has been pretty well intact. 
and there's good closing reduction here. So, when do you need to do open reductions? Displacement in the uh, subtalar joint. That's right, yeah. Here's one in which there's a 14 year old, and this one here, you can see that there's involvement of the here. It's a big fragment here, so you can actually, this one, you, you got, fortunately, you don't have a lot of comminution of the articular surface, which is characteristic of the child. And so this one had a, here's the articular for, uh, surface was depressed, and then the articular was lifted up and stabilized through an open reduction, and then the stability was held by a, uh, some screws right through there. So navicular fractures, you ever seen one? Yeah. They're pretty rare. This one was missed. It showed up because he continued to have pain. And this one, this is the date of injury, but unless you really look for them and palpate them, they'll be missed. So it's very common. Here you can see the fracture here. And these fractures are often missed. And this one we had, was seen in the emergency room. It's thought, they said, again, he just had a foot sprain. So it comes back two months because he's not any better. And here you can see there's usually a, a kind of a bursting effect with the navicular. And so it's widened, you can see here. And here he is when he showed up two months in uh, the office. And you can see that he's healed, but the fracture was incongruous and he may have require fusion or uh, some kind of treatment later on. So the fracture healed with articular incongruity, which would produce an early degenerative joint disease. Now the cuboid, okay, here's the cuboid. What kind of force usually causes the cuboid fracture? Uh, usually it's an ab abduction That's force. That's right, you're usually a compressive force. Here you can see the cuboid. And so you look, because of that, you may have some tension forces on the tarsal metatarsal joint, so you need to look for those. And what else do you need to look for? Well, here you can see the, the mechanism of injury is by a pure abduction force, and so you can see that creates a compression effect here. But you need to look here at the distal ones because you can actually get abduction displacement of the, of the uh, necks of the metatarsals. So, what's the, what's the description? What's the characteristic description they call it? The nutcracker fracture. That's right, very good. It's a nutcracker fracture. Why is that? Because <laughs> it's, it's like a nut mechanism is like <laughs> cracking a nut. That's right. You know, it's, it's usually a compressive force that you see here. So, there you go. Now, these are often are missed because it's difficult to see the, this is the normal view, but here you can see there is displacement right here, and this one is down and displaced here. And you see it, and here you go to reduce it, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? You have to push the cuboid up to That's get That's right, you have to reestablish it, the length of it. And usually here it is, you can see that the joint surface is impacted and compressed, and so to get in there you need to go in and get something to lift it up, and then you, you try to get it back to a normal level, and then you fix it with pins or a screw. And usually you use pins because you want to you want to maintain the congruity in the joint uh, function, so you take the pins out when it's healed in children, which is pretty rapid. It's not imperfect, but it's, it's really a little bit more stable. Now, tarsal metatarsal ones usually occur, occur like this. And what fails? Where's the big, what's the one that you really want to worry about when it fails? Which one is the so-called key fracture? You know, second metatarsal. And so, you, there you have here, you usually have a fracture there, but then you have dislocations of the others. And, of course, here's a good example of that, where you have that dislocated. So what do you try? Do you, what do you do to treat it? What do you have to? You have to reduce it. That's right. You have to really reduce the second one, and once you reduce the second one, the uh, um, the others will line up. And if it's non-displaced, you can it's less than three millimeters. You can just watch it and, and do a closed reduction in percutaneous wires. But 
most of the time they're like this one where they're markedly dis so you're going to probably need to do an open reduction to stabilize it. Now, we look at metatarsal fractures in the metaphysis, diaphysis, neck, and head. Now, metatarsal fractures, you talked about, you mentioned the base of the metatarsal. What about this fracture? Is this one that you really need to be aggressive on? No, sir. What, what does this usually occur? Where do you see these? Uh, you see these in the adult, I mean in the athlete. Uh, they have a severe abduction force. And what, what pulls that off? Uh, perineus brevis. Well, everyone thinks that, but it's really the it's the plantar ligaments that really are strict. Now, this is another thing. This is The fractures are usually transverse to the long axis, but if they're somewhat parallel to it, what about this if it comes in and doesn't have this? Is that a fracture? A lot of times the, the emergency room people will see that and they think he's got a fracture. What is this here? Now, that's the apophysis of, of the peroneus brevis. You can see that. And, you know, the, fra the fracture line is perpendicular to the shaft, now, what do you tell about the parents? You, they get the x-rays, and then you have them come back in about th two weeks or three weeks. What are you going to tell them? It's slow to heal. What else? Why is that? Because it's got tension forces. Yes, sir. What else occurs? Uh, well, the one thing, the fracture line will s spread. Oh, and when it comes back, here it is initially, and then here it is here. You know, and they'll ask you, what are you going to do, doctor? He's got, still got that fracture and looks worse. You know, he's good in sports. And so what are you going to do here? Keep watching it. That's right. Just wait it out because you, there's tension forces and the fracture is slow to solidify. You just wait. Now, sometimes you can actually, that physis can come off and that's from the perineus brevis. But if they're down more distal, it's usually due to the plantar ligaments that hold it. Evulsive. Now, in the adults, you see these Jones fractures, and where are the Jones fractures? Oh, well, they, you, the fracture line usually extends between the, the joint. Of yeah, the it's really, and what kind of bone is it? Is it metaphyseal bone or diaphyseal bone? It's metaphyseal bone. Well, actually, it's, it's really in the diaphyses. And what's, what's characteristic about diaphyseal fractures? Uh, I think that's a... In this one, it's like a watershed area, and that's what Yeah, it's well, it's also, they're slow to heal. And, of course, they have a tension force. I don't have a true Jones, but here's one that was a metaphysis here. And you can see that it's just minimally displaced, but in most of the ones that are, are in right here are minimally displaced. And so here it comes back at 15 months, and it's still slow to heal. And if it comes over here, they're going to be a lot more symptomatic associated with it. And so how do you treat them? Put an axial <laughs> screw up there. And, and so the, what the treatment is here usually involves the fifth metatarsal. And so remember, diaphyseal bone is slow to heal. So you usually put a compressive force on there with a... a um, axillary screw to hasten the union. If you, you don't need to do it unless they're really symptomatic here because this is metaphyseal bone and it heals pretty rapidly. Okay, the neck, here the initial fracture. Oh my lord, what's going on? Is it fractured or broken? Broken. <laughs> yeah, okay, well it's displaced and you know, again, he was a star quarterback, and you know he's going to be good in sports. What are you going to do with this one? Uh, well, this fracture you can probably need to reduce it. And then yeah, hi, it's a little tough to reduce it. Actually, Marshall is swollen, and you, it's hard to get that little fragment. Well, here you can see he's a young patient, so you just say, well, let's wait. And you can see that they will have a tendency to remodel occur if they're if they're not angulated in the sagittal plane, but in the just this one's really not angulated; it's just translocated, so it has a tendency to heal. Now, here is our patient that had the cuboid fracture and also had fractures of the metatarsal neck. 
How do you stabilize those? In a great inch medullary nails. Yeah, you can do that. A lot of people do. What else? What do, do they do? You can do retrograde. Retrograde. Things. But what's the problem with retrograde? You, you got to get it in the. <laughs> yeah, you got to get the dorsiflex the ankle, and usually the pins are sticking out. Yes, sir. Whereas this one, you can leave the pin in. So, this is associated with a nutcracker fracture. As you can see here, and here you can see, passing the nail anagrade is better because it can be done percutaneously and the end can be buried so you don't have to come back and take the pins out and hold them. And if you pass a nail retrograde, often you need to do a platter incision to start the head and this pin is usually left protruding out of the skin. So here are some that are um, anti-grade to hold them. Now, one of the things you need to be careful of is that often in the metatarsal head, you got to look real closely. What do you see with this x-ray? What do you see with this x-ray? Well, he was, this was another one that was sent out because she had a foot sprain. And, but she continued to have pain every time she would move her toes. Fourth metatarsal. Yeah, so it was initially said that she didn't have a fracture. But if you look really close, there is a little double density here. So how are you going to evaluate this one? Well, you could do a CT scan, but that's pretty expensive. What you do here, you, you still have pain and swelling, and so what do you do here? You can get a oblique view, and of course with a oblique view, you can see that fragment. And this fragment required an open reduction to put back, and of course, it, fortunately it didn't heal and it didn't get avascular, but that's something you'd be concerned about. So often these are overlooked and missed. And that's why you need to get three views, oblique views, so you can see it. So, phalanx fractures, they're usually simple. What are they usually caused by? A direct blow. Yeah, yeah, something, you know, drops something on that foot. Something's dropped on the foot, a big a brick or a rock or something falls off the table and usually a compressive force. And they're usually, if they're not displaced, that's a compression type of fracture. And they're usually simple, so you just treat them simple. A lot of times you can just put them in a heavy shoe or a cast shoe or a short leg cast if they're really painful. Now, what about this one, though? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sometimes you're going to need to manipulate them. So, you st reduction, how are you going to stabilize it? You can buddy tape it. Yeah, very good. You can just buddy tape it. It's usually adequate for a post-reduction immobilization. So the indications for surgery, what about this one? What kind of fracture we have here? Well, this is a Salter Harris 4. Mm -hmm. And what do you need to do with this one? Well, this one, if you don't fix it, it's going to be incongruous. And it's got tension forces on it, so it's going to be slow to heal. So this one needed, the uh, reduction needed to be perfect to realign that joint. And so it was, had an open reduction initially had some pins across it, but they were removed. And here you can see that the Harris Park growth lance lines are continuing to grow. Although there's a little concern, there may have been a bone bridge here. Now, this is not an uncommon fracture, it's an abduction injury, and you've got avulsion of the collateral ligaments. Is this one that's going to be a problem? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, th these are often are symptomatic and it's got tension forces on it. And so usually, because of the tension forces, they f they're slow to unite or they fail to unite, and they usually require a simple stabilization. If you're good, you may be able to do it percutaneously or not, you make a little incision there and then put a compressive screw or just a screw across it. So, what do we have here? What's this? Here you can see this avulsion. So, this is a fracture in the hand. What's that fracture similar to? What do you call that in the hand? Mallet finger. Yeah, what else? Or, uh, what, what else? It's usually do what kind of sport? They go to catch a jersey. Base, baseball. Right. So, it's a baseball finger, but if you're going to call it, it uh, should be described as a baseball toe. 
But anyway, what's going on here? Yeah, these are like the ones that you see. They're usually in the hand. They're usually facial injury. So what's attached here? You need a gel. Yeah, the extension. What's attached here? The flexion gel tendons. Plug, yes, yeah. Sir. Uh, and usually if you don't do this, they'll have a tendency to sublux. And again, these are slow to heal. So you go ahead and actually open and do a, uh, a uh, put a screw across it. And remember, just like in the finger, in the hand and the finger, they can be an open fracture. So the complications, initial crush injury. Here's one that had initial crush injury. And this patient had a growth arrest, didn't have any growth after one year. Now, there are also crush injuries are common in the pediatric age group. This is a 10-year-old that went over the fence and climbed an oil well rig as it was pumping oil. And they had all kinds of signs around there, uh, danger of oil well, do not climb. And this kid and his friend decided they would go over there and ride the thing. Well, this is what happened. What do you need to do next? You're going to be able to save that? These are no, vas no vascular. And this is questionable. Amputation. Yeah, right. And so, what type? Well, you could do a Liz Frank or yeah. a higher. Yeah, you can do actually do it right at the tarsal metatarsal joint. Maintain as much length as you can. Mm -hmm. And so that was done that, and then you put a finger like this. So here's the final closure that he had. Who do you think he saw next? Did he go to the doctor? Where else did he? Who did he see next? The shoe. No. Specialist. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, actually, they got a, a, a settlement because um, the oil company paid some money out. But yet he was 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 where he wasn't supposed to. Now, this is the last one here. This is a kid who was um, out in one of the outlying cities and appeared to the emergency room. And you can see there's displacement at the um, calcaneal um, cuboid joint, but there's no really other fractures. And the initial physician, emergency room physician, said, well, it's just a, looks like there may be a little fracture there, but um, He's not, you know, he doesn't need any treatment. But here's the clinical view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's your concern here? Compartment syndrome. That's right, very good. So there is a compartment syndrome. So uh, it is a compartment syndrome. So what's your treatment? Well, it's a little controversial, yeah. but uh, this one here, he still had some sensation in his foot and it was still fairly fresh. So you do a fasciotomy, and you do it from a medial approach. You do a, actually a kind of a medial incision here, and then a medial fasciotomy, and then you have to do dorsal fasciotomies, as you can see here. So you can see that most of the fractures are fairly simple, but we've, here we've gone through some that can have complications. So thank you very much for your participation.